In this video, I will uh, talk about mechanical actuators and uh, mostly this will mean pumps and uh, a comparison of the, the pumps that we typically use in, uh, in lab on a chip. So that and I will talk about micro valves and I will also talk about some specific microchannel layouts since uh, even though these are not actively actuating, they are passively uh, actuating your liquids in uh, one way or another. So the, the most popular by far in uh, bioanalytical uh, applications and, uh, and in lab on a chip also are syringe pumps for the reason that uh, they are quite stable, they are precise and comparatively quite cheap to, to fabricate. Um, in a syringe pump, or in other words, an infusion pump, the liquid is filled into a syringe, which can be metal or, uh, or glass or, or plastic. Uh, typically it would be glass or plastic. Um, and it is driven by a plunger. The plunger in, term, in turn is uh, driven by um, an axle and the stepper motor. Or more specifically, uh, uh, drive screw. So the drive screw is uh, what is connected to the stepper motor and the stepper motor takes a number of steps to actuate your pump and uh, by that you drive this uh, car to which the syringe is mounted and then the syringe plunger is pushed with, uh, with the movement of this car. So for plastic uh, syringes most typical would be a horizontal layout like you see above and then for glass syringes typical would be um, a vertical layout where the glass syringes act like uh, pistons and uh, its precision is somewhat better with the vertical layout um, however you can also use glass syringes with uh, with a uh, infusion pump layout and uh, for instance Hamilton glass uh, syringes that is a more precise uh, setup because for the plastic syringe there is always the, the matter of uh, flexibility of the plastic that will uh, take down from the precision and um, advantages as I uh, stated before high precision relatively low cost good stability however the volume is limited by the size of your syringe, by the volume of your uh, syringe. So even though you have all these advantages, having to reload the syringe is a problem, but you can have a, a, a valve, a three-state valve, which uh, can connect uh, input and output. Um, and then you can select whether you want to fill or empty your syringe so you can you can solve it in a way that you don't have to disconnect the syringe every time, but it is still uncomfortable that you need to fill up your syringe and then uh, keep pumping. So for that, there are other solutions and uh, most popular in microfluidics and, uh, and in lab on chip applications, or one of the most popular would be peristaltic pumps, which uh, means that there is a, a rotor with the rollers. So this one here that squeezes on the uh, typically flexible tube and uh, as it squeezes on it it moves uh, air pockets and liquid ahead and uh, by that way you get a pulsatile flow so as it as it pushes on the the tubing um, the, the flow rate goes up and down it's not as stable as uh, you would get with the syringe pump with a stepper motor you get a very good stability once the inertia of the system is gone and uh, you reach the steady state with pumping it's going to have a very steady flow rate with a syringe pump and not with a peristaltic pump and um, however you can take advantage of that in certain applications like uh, droplet microfluidics where this kind of uh, pulsatility can actually be an advantage because you have a, a two-phase flow anyway so you can just uh, squeeze the phases in and uh, have it um, pushed out in, um, in this, uh, this manner. So having to pump one phase and then the other and then one phase and then the other, that's uh, a good way to go in. Drop with microfluidics. 
also I've noticed that peristalsis is very much a part of us. Uh, our bowels also move uh, food inside with uh, with a peristaltic action. And uh, yeah, as I, just as I said, it has a diff uh, decent applicability to droplet microfluidics. Advantages are that uh, these are simple and cheap to make. They also use a stepper motor to drive the rotor, but uh, in comparison with, with the syringe pumps, they are also quite uh, simple to make. And they are capable of generating a continuous flow, and you can also use them to recirculate the liquid in a, in a circuit. And the disadvantage is that uh, there is a pulsatile flow. So in this uh, paper, they uh, have an interesting application of uh, peristaltic pumping with, uh, with a valve that will open and close to input uh, different phases and uh, pumping um, these different phases one after another can result in a quite nice uh, droplet flow. So interesting to check out if you're curious. Um, pressure pumps. As I have said before, uh, microfluidic flows are by default pressure driven. So this is one way of uh, achieving it with a vacuum pump. But uh, while this example has a vacuum pump here, you can also have a positive pressure uh, system where uh, the, the pressure pump generates the pressure and pushes the liquid. But um, generating suction is also an option. Down here you have a, a pressure pump. Of course, uh, if you reverse the, the pumping, then you can make it uh, a vacuum pump. But by default, let's talk about the situation where you have a pressure pump. In any case, uh, your, um, your pump is typically a diaphragm pump. And, uh, and, and more than that, it can be a reciprocating pump where you have uh, this uh, biphasic action of two diaphragms uh, moving the, the liquid forward or backwards, depending on uh, which direction you set. Whatever the actuation principle is, it can be a, a piezoelectric pump or just a simple uh, diaphragm type pump. It can also be a peristaltic pump used in a pressure pump, but you need a, a pressure vessel which uh, acts as sort of a fluidic capacitor that evens out the flow and then what you get at the end is also a stable flow rate over time. And uh, to, to turn it into a fluidic system, what people typically do is they add the closed reservoir through which the, the pump uh, pushes the liquid or pulls. And in the reservoir you have the bulk of your uh, liquid or buffer that you want to work with that is pushed on by the pressure into your chip or pulled into your chip, that's another uh, option. It's really precise. It has a steady flow rate. It's possible to miniaturize. However, it is also more complex and more pricey than the two other alternatives. And I'm not going to go into more pumps. There are more options, yes. There are quite wide, uh, wild options uh, you can pump with. Uh, acoustic waves, you can pump with uh, with uh, thermal evaporation, you can pump with uh, just uh, even just pushing a button, you can generate a positive or negative uh, pressure. Um, these are also options, but uh, I'm not going to talk about them because these are the three that are most commonly used in, um, in microfluidics, lab on the chip, bioanalytical and analytical chemistry applications relevant to microfluidics. So you will be sure to encounter these two because uh, they are by far the most popular and um, flow stability with pressure pumps is excellent, can be down to 0.1% uh, coefficient of variation. So volume variation or volumetric flow rate vari variation is less than 1%. With a syringe pump, um, it can go from 3% to 25%. And uh, yeah, with peristaltic pump, it's not even reported. It's uh, quite, quite bad without uh, adding the pressure vessel. The, the precision is uh, the best with a pressure pump. 
intermediate with the syringe pump and worst with the peristaltic pump. But these two are quite close to each other in terms of, uh, of uh, precision. Response time is uh, less than four seconds with uh, a pressure pump. Around, uh, uh, the, around seconds with the syringe pump. However, this also is dependent on the flow rate that you want to achieve. So the lower the flow rate, the faster the syringe pump will catch up to your new uh, flow parameters and the faster the inertia will be gone from your system as a, as a factor. So yes, you need to, when you start pumping, you need to wait a little until the, the flow rate stabilizes. In, with a syringe pump, it, uh, it's a steady rise to your plateau. But then once you reach the plateau, until your syringe runs out, uh, it is stable over time. With a peristaltic pump, the settling time is a little slower and the pulsatile nature will not be gone over time because that's just how it works. Control parameter for the pressure pump is pressure. For the syringe pump, it's uh, the revolutions per minute of the stepper motor. And for the peristaltic pump, pump you can calibrate. Uh, but uh, yeah, likewise, uh, you can control the revolutions per minute for the stepper motor or more, more uh, specifically the driving voltage of your stepper motor, but you can calibrate it to the flow rate. Flow recirculation, actually it is possible with these two. Uh, so this is not entirely correct that it is not possible. Not possible without accessories, yes because uh, you need to uh, reroute the flow to, through your uh, peristaltic pump, which is actually the situation here also. So anyway, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, recirculate if uh, that would be your purpose, but with the syringe pump, uh, it is not really a possibility because you are limited to the syringe volume. Um, I took here examples from the Dolomite catalog. Uh, these are all high-end uh, products. These are all also quite uh, costly. Uh, so yeah, the most expensive is the pe uh, pressure pump, which, uh, which is typically the, the top of the line. Uh, syringe pump depends on uh, what kind of choice you make. An entry-level syringe pump can run for only 275 euros, but uh, you can also make one for yourself uh, from open source hardware components for uh, less than that. Uh, but then the calibration is entirely your, uh, your thing. And um, for a top of the line uh, dual channel research grade pump, the you know, price might go up to 6,000 euros uh, if you buy from a catalog. With the peristaltic pump, with just the peristaltic pump and not the drivers and whatnot. So again, the, the price is not an entirely good comparison because this one is only the module. Uh, but you can get a, a Chinese uh, peristaltic pump, pump from, a, from a catalog for 500 euros, which is calibrated and assembled into a neat package where you can uh, control the flow rate from, uh, from a user interface, from a graphical user interface and, uh, and, and have a more comfortable approach. You can also buy multi-channel peristaltic pumps where one um, motor is driving multiple rotors that uh, push on multiple tubes. Those uh, run for 1,000 to a couple of thousand euros. And, uh, but again, these are the Chinese ones. So uh, yeah, this one is our peristaltic pump. Uh, if you ever needed, this is open source hardware, was uh, a thesis project of uh, one of our um, team members, Martin Grossberg, and uh, it's a wireless cordless system, so it runs from batteries. It runs from batteries and uh, communicates with uh, Wi-Fi. Um, I mean, with Wi-Fi. Uh, so these are, these are just uh, the power management boards. This one is the stepper motor. It's uh, off the shelf, quite uh, cheap from a catalog. And um, this one was made to uh, run 10 to 15 minutes at maximum flow rate. Maximum flow rate being uh, 72 milliliters per minute. So 
This one is not uh, really a precision pump, it's uh, going from 12 to 72 milliliters per minute flow rate. So if you need something in this uh, range, then, um, then you can use this design. Uh, down here is uh, just an example of uh, droplet generation, which we uh, tried to do, but this pump is too fast for that. So what you see is a two-phase emulsion, not really proper uh, droplets. Yeah, you can download uh, the project files from GitHub and you can look at uh, the documentation in the thesis project. Um, I will say a few words about microvalves. And uh, these microvalves are possible to integrate into your device. I'm not going to talk about large valves because that's uh, not really interesting, to be honest. And the working principles are the same in the macro and the micro scale. Most of the valves that we use on the macro scale and the cheapest ones would be solenoid type valves where uh, you have a magnet core that uh, drives or the, the solenoid drives a magnetic core and uh, that opens and closes your, uh, uh, your membrane um, that, uh, that opens and closes the channel. So in this, these diagrams you always have uh, the flow going like here and here's the the membrane that you actuate with uh, one of these driving principles first one is a pneumatic pump that is also something uh, or a pneumatic valve that is also something that uh, people use quite often where you apply an external pressure and when it is pressurized then the diaphragm is closed when the pressure is removed then the diaphragm opens and you have a flow heater also uh, kind of works similarly, but uh, in this case you heat up a medium gas liquid or solid that uh, when it expands closes the membrane or diaphragm, whatever you would like to call it. Both terms are, are kind of valid. This one works with a, with a metal that uh, by means of thermal expansion um, can uh, can be heated up and uh, by means of thermal expansion can uh, close and open your valve. It can also be piezoelectric where you actuate uh, the piezo crystal and by that move the, uh, the membrane. It can also be a, a number of piezos that uh, move your membrane. You can also use uh, electromagnetic actuation either by, uh, by means of, uh, of uh, electromagnets or um, through the principle that I explained with the solenoid valves. And then there are more exotic uh, applications like using a hydrogel or, um, or um, with, uh, with this electrochemical principle. So yes, there are electrochemical and, uh, and chemical type uh, valves as well, but most common would be solenoid uh, pressure actuated and heat actuated valves. PSO maybe also uh, if you want uh, fast action. Micromixers. So I will talk uh, a few words about uh, different microchannel geometries because this belongs under uh, the actuators quite well. Um, one of your most common mixing designs is, well, one of the most common would be your Dean mixer or snake mixer uh, that I have mentioned in a previous lecture, but you can complicate that a little bit by adding additional features like a, like a staggered um, uh, mixing geometry like you see here. So this one would be your snake or serpentine or Dean mixer, uh, but it is complicated in addition with uh, these um, staggered side channels or let's say uh, the staggered design that increases the surface area between your different liquids even higher. So if you rem recall from, uh, from uh, previous lectures in um, laminar flow the different phases do not mix only through their interfaces. So you need to increase the surface area of, uh, of the interface between these two liquids 
to uh, make mixing better. Like, like you see here, the yellow and the blue liquid mixing to green uh, in this uh, design. Uh, staggered hammering bone would be um, a 3D design where you have um, you have a geometry that uh, faces towards the flow and it also has uh, trenches or uh, or grooves uh, into which the liquid can go and uh, thereby you increase the surface area but um, generally impeding the flow with some micro pillars or similar uh, can also help mixing. So if you have a, a design like you will in the lab, where you have a staggered micro pillar uh, layout, then again you force the flow lines to cross. Zigzag mixer, similar idea to the snake, only uh, in this case uh, there are only 45 degree angles. Snake mixer can also be 3D, where you not just go around, but also up and down. Again, helps to increase the surface area. Trapezoid, again, a snake mixer, but with, uh, with more uh, um, acute angles uh, rather, than a, rather than a nice curvature. Microreactors, very important also. Microreactors can be uh, in two different uh, uh, concepts. Um, one is where you have a, a large uh, surface area where liquids can interact, but uh, it's also quite popular to have a snaking channel that is a mixer and a reactor for the, the reaction to take place, so that you have a uniform mixing of reagents and at the same time a large area for it to take place. If you need uh, temperature control, then uh, that would be under this uh, snaking channel. And uh, two more uh, geometries that I would like to talk about. So uh, filters and membranes, when uh, you need to, uh, to filter out certain particles from the flow, then um, you can either use a porous membrane or you can use a bunch of micro pillars. And in this case, uh, the, the study wants to capture or filter out red blood cells. So the distance between these pillars is uh, exactly so that these uh, red blood cells cannot pass and they are caught up, but the liquid can pass through. Hydrodynamic focusing is uh, something quite important for droplet microfluidics, but also for cell sorting. So we have uh, what is called a sheath fluid. Um, in our applications, this mostly means oil, which flows on the side at a higher flow rate than the uh, carrier in the middle or the, the, the second phase, which for us is typically water flowing in the middle. In the case of cell sorting, uh, the, the middle stream would have the cells and, uh, and they would be by means of uh, hydrodynamic focusing pushed into a single line. So that's uh, for, for cell sorting and uh, alignment into a single stream. For droplet microfluidics, center steam would be where the droplets flow, but uh, this is already uh, mentioned in another lecture. So in, uh, in this video I talked about uh, pump types and compared them most popular pumps. I have to say there are others, of course, uh, lots of other ways of, uh, and also integrated micro pumps are a thing, but I talked about the ones that are most common and the ones that we use uh, in the labs, microvalves and uh, specific microchannel layouts. Mm -hmm.